All right, friends. I didn't know if anybody was going to come tonight because of the rain. So I'm really impressed, especially for our friends who rode their bikes. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for making it out and uh, being here together. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh yeah like happy to be here and hi friends on home who maybe smartly are staying dry <laughs> great to have you as well and we are once again moving kind of in this circular way with this book with the true source of healing by Tenzin Wangel Rinpoche and tonight and kind of for the next three weeks we're going to deep dive into these three precious pills. So these three precious pills of stillness, silence, and kind of warmth and spaciousness. As anyone who's been involved in Buddhism even a little bit, especially Tibetan Buddhism, there's like, oh, there are these three things. And then there are these other three things. And then there's like eight things. <laughs> and then there's three things again. So I'm sorry we're going to do a little bit of that because these three precious pills, they actually relate and overlay kind of um, very directly with body, speech, and mind. And I'm sure folks have heard those terms again if you've been um, around Buddhist teachings. And the idea is on our path to awakening, we actually have to go through a whole different variety of approaches to start kind of, you could say, purifying or simplifying or becoming skillful. So we think of our body, right? Everything that we're doing with our body, our actions, our behaviors, and then um, our speech. And this one I love, it's always so tricky because sometimes, not always, sometimes we can have like a whole day where we don't say anything unskillful. Has anyone ever had a day like you didn't see anybody and you know you're just with your cat <laughs> like it's fine but it's not just speech on the outside it's really our inner speech right and most of us don't make it through a half day without some fairly toxic shit inside our own head right sometimes directed at ourselves sometimes directed at others and part of this purification process with um speech is really finding the spaciousness of silence uh, with body it's this stillness so our body a lot of the actions and behaviors in the world are are very helpful very skillful we can do such good things we can hug people we can build things we can gesticulate meaningfully and care right with our hands but finding this state of stillness in our body it's it's like this refreshment it's being able to recalibrate ourselves. So we have the body finding the stillness, the speech finding the silence, and then mind, which of course is the real tough one, uh, being able to find a sense not only of the speech, right, that's going on in there, the kind of narrative and thoughts, but really like the whole phenomena that exists in the mind. Also just the general orientation of our mind. Whatever we are pointing our mind towards is how our life unfolds. So how do we kind of, you know, purify has a weird connotation sometimes, but I like that word because it, to me, brings up this reality that for things to become liberated and free, it's like they got to move to the surface and purify. So I think of, you know, kind of rising up with the heat and evaporating. And so with the mind, we're looking for that quality of just warm spaciousness. And that's really the quality of our spacious awareness. That's not somewhere we go to. It's somewhere that's always there, just like silence, just like stillness. So even if we are in movement with our body, even when we are speaking, there are still qualities of stillness and silence. And the same with our mind. Even if we are thinking and doing good work, if we're writing or making art, there is still this kind of warm spaciousness that we can connect to. And these three precious pills that relate to body, speech, and mind, these are kind of the very preliminary jumping off points to the soul retrieval work of this book. And so... Again, if you haven't been here, no problem. If you have, I mean, it's hard to hold our attention span for a week, so refreshment is good. This book really helps us, and kind of the main purpose is to 
develop a process of retrieving from the natural world essences that we really need in our life to become whole and complete. And these essences from the natural world, as you may recall, are the groundedness and the connectedness of earth, the comfort and fluidity of water, the flexibility and movement of air, the openness and accommodation of space, and the joy and inspiration of fire. So before we get to those, we have to really develop, kind of make the ground ready by developing these qualities of silence, stillness, and spaciousness. So that's kind of the trajectory that we're going to be moving towards, coming back from and around. And just as a reminder, or for folks who are new, the, the idea of soul retrieval, and this is, I, again, I'm not sure the quite the exact translation in Tibetan, but the idea or the process is to help us release from what's called the pain body or the pain identity. This way that we lock and close down around an idea of ourselves, often a deficient idea of ourselves. Oh, I could be, or I should be, or why am I not? Just this perception of <clears throat> what we should be doing and how things should be going for us that creates a constriction. Like you can think of the pain body as the opposite of, you know, like a, a cat warming itself in the sun. That's like the opposite, right? Open, supple, mel and then the like, you know, that contraction. <clears throat> it's a mental contraction. It's a physical contraction. It's a spiritual contraction. We lose access to any idea of the world and ourself that's kind of fluid, and open, and moving. And so this process of soul retrieval helps us kind of return the essences of who we truly are by aligning our mind, our thoughts, and our practice with the natural world. It's just extremely beautiful. And as I've mentioned before, the Thon tradition here out of Tibet is a little different than Tibetan Buddhism. They have a lot of overlap. They're obviously both from Tibet. There's a lot of um, meditation practices and non-duality, but it's really in this Bon tradition and this indigenous tradition from Tibet where there's such an emphasis on the natural world and restoring and recovering our sense of goodness from the natural world. And you'll hear Wang Biao Rinpoche in, in this book and in his talks and other books you know, he very, he's always like tending to his relationship to the natural world. And it's not like he lives in a mountain hermitage. He lives in Albany, right? <laughs> so he lives right in the middle of it, but just going out and he lets himself receive the world and really receive those essences. So after we've kind of deepened our practice these next couple of weeks with the three precious pills, we're going to start developing our relationship with earth and with fire and with space. And that means actually, I love what he says in the book, like set up a date with your natural essences, right? How are you going to make time to be with, right? Just like you would make time to be with a friend. And he says, it can be kind of boring at first. You're like, where's my phone? I'm looking at the sky, right? And we have to actually, that's why it's so important to kind of cultivate and, and prime the pump with these practices where we can experience stillness, silence, and spacious warmth, openness. Otherwise, it's kind of, it's like, it's going to miss us. We're going to be, um, yeah, not available for that. So that's our trajectory. And this evening, we are really going to hang out quite a lot in in stillness so this is going to mean this is going to be really exciting for some people here a lot less instruction uh for some people they're like oh my god where's my mind gonna go but either way it will be great i'm gonna kind of up front give us these primers and i'd like to really read the full description from Wangil rinpoche then we'll go into practice we'll have some time for questions and we'll talk further about the next steps on this journey of soul retrieval. Any questions? Okay, great. So yeah, I want to, I read this a couple weeks ago when we were first starting this book, but it's, gosh, it's so beautiful. Um, so he calls this practice of stillness. He calls it the refuge of unbounded sacred space. He says, you can access the first refuge of unbounded sacred space through the stillness of your body. 
He says, and you can try this if you like, we'll go right into meditation after I read this. Explore this now. Sit and close your eyes. <clears throat> Bring your attention to the stillness of your body. And really take time to feel the stillness. As you rest in awareness of the simple and direct experience of stillness, your mind becomes calmer, quieter, more settled and grounded. Even in moments of restlessness, your physical agitation can remind you to come back to stillness. As you become more familiar with stillness and its grounding qualities, you experience just being. And stillness becomes a doorway to the first inner refuge, unbounded sacred space of being. This unbounded sacred space is known as the Dharmakaya, the body of emptiness. The Dharmakaya is the changeless essence of your nature and the nature of all beings. It's the source of all elemental essences. Connecting with this source allows the healing qualities of the elements to arise and manifest in you. Recognizing and abiding in this first refuge of unbounded sacred space heals the soul. Maybe there's already some presence of that great sense of unbounded sacred space in the body. And as we ease more into this practice of connecting to stillness, we can bring our full attention and awareness to the space of the body. Let's begin by really feeling a sense of the physical or form body. So breathing in, being aware of the body, its weight, its temperature, and the sensations where the body is touching the air around the room or the fabric of your clothing, and sustaining that awareness of the body through the exhale.
And of course, distraction arises, thoughts and sounds, memories and images. Each time, just keep coming back into a sense of being in the body, feeling the body, and sensing this form or physical body from within the body. Whenever you return from distraction, being carried away, see if you can notice the quality of returning to the body, that sense of fullness of presence that might arise when returning back to the presence of the body, an awareness saturating the body.
the more and more moments of having our full awareness in the body, that natural stillness might start to arise. And alongside the stillness, actually, paradoxically, the presence of vividness, of vibrancy, aliveness in the body. You may start to notice the layer of the body that is the subtle body, the body of energy, where emotional residue from the day, the week, or the lifetime may also be experienced through the body, including this layer and level of the presence of our awareness in the body. And there's an invitation, not a forcing, not a needing, but there's an invitation to explore this possibility of the body as this space of unbounded, sacred spaciousness. Once we've brought our awareness to the body and felt the sense of the form body, recognize and experience the subtle body, energy, movement. And as our awareness permeates all these layers of the body, we may find, look for, or consider this body of emptiness, the Dharmakaya. 
It's a sense or a feeling that there is limitless, boundless, sacred space just by resting attention and awareness in the body. Just an invitation, something to look out for, settling deeper and deeper to the awareness of the body and maybe discovering spaciousness permeating the body. Keep coming back, finding more and more subtlety, more and more presence in the body so that the mind has no interest in going elsewhere. The refuge of unbounded sacred space in the body is all the mind, heart, and body could ever desire.
and the more established we become in this body, the less that our distractions really carry us too far away. Really noticing we can come right back no matter how many times we get carried away. Reconnecting, resettling in this invitation of this body of emptiness, unbounded sacred space within the body itself, or simply the experience of continuing to saturate the body with awareness. Notice whether there is a presence of stillness and if there is a presence of dullness or agitation, no problem. Just invite this quality of stillness one more time for the remaining moments of practice, refreshing that awareness in the body, awareness that isn't dull, an awareness that is bright luminous with presence.
when the bell rings, see if you can maintain a sense of this presence and awareness in the body. Notice as we shift from practice back into engagement and discussion in the room, it's still possible to maintain some stillness, even with the movement of the mind body. Thank you for your practice. <clears throat> so as we transition into the more engaged Sangha part of our time together, just a reminder and a refresher that our ability to be together here in Sangha really invites us and asks us to be holding all aspects of our time here together with the utmost um, kind of skillfulness and precision. So really considering our body, speech, and mind, and can we hold them with compassion as we engage with one another? So as we're listening to what others are saying, as we ourselves are speaking, doing so from a place of compassion and care, really recognizing that there's so little we actually know about one another. It's exciting, but also can lead to misunderstanding or um, even judgment. And so to really recognize and understand that everybody here has an unbelievable complexity of life that has led them to this moment and to hold each other as Buddhas, some of us are closer than others, okay? But we're all like on our way, right? That's the spirit of Sangha. So really kind of hold each other in that sense of care. Without it, it it's really hard to have a space for discussion, engagement, and learning. And while meditation is great, and me talking to you about teachings is great, it's usually in the reflection, both you thinking and reflecting about what you might say or listening to another's experience, where a lot of the learning happens. It's really important. So just keeping that in mind. And it would be wonderful if folks would like to share any questions or reflections, either um, here in the room, you can grab the mic, or online, you can raise a little hand. Oh, that was cool. <laughs> It was like a outro song. Uh, any questions or reflections on that practice? A little different than we've been doing recently. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I became aware that it feels like there's some way that I kind of left my body like years and years ago and locked myself up in a sort of a safe space inside my mind where I could, you know, figure stuff out and I could be like doing amazing things or, you know, I could be whatever, that there was this sort of imaginary world that I could yeah. have like locked myself in. And so it felt, and I'm familiar with that, but it also felt like this practice is engaging with the body. It felt like there's a kind of a, a sort of a fear about engaging that there's sort of a vulnerability and a sort of a thing about like, I, I could get attacked again, or I could get stalked, or I could get mm. this or that, that there's things that, that somehow this imaginary separation felt like it protected me from. And so this whole thing of opening, um, you know, it felt very tentative and very like, yeah. you know, um, just uh, not sure what the right word is kind of tentative or tender or like yeah. a bit scary, like, yeah. you know, peeking in, yeah. this kind of thing. So I don't know if there's a, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, um, it's beautifully described. I think that that's um, not an uncommon experience and such a, you know, frequent way that people create safety, you know, is to like exit the body if the body has been unsafe. And and absolutely, um, you know, we hear, I've often heard, you know, folks with a whole different variety of reasons in the past for exiting the body. And as we do practices that invite us back into the body, there's that hesitation, you know, as you said, that kind of tentativeness. But what I loved of what you said was there's kind of like a peeking in. And I'm curious, like, what was that peeking in like? Was there a little bit of like kind of inhabiting in and then, okay, I'm going back, like the kind of titration or? It, it felt more like um, kind of filtering in. It, mm -hmm. it felt like that there wasn't a sort of a, that separate peeking in sort of identity yeah. was maintained. It felt more like sort of, there was this sort of a little bit of a diffuseness. Yeah. And um, a sort of a hint of, because I'm used to sort of like I'm experiencing something. Right. And this felt more like, no, there's this thing that's sort of experiencing itself. And it had um, very diffuse kind of edges. You know, yeah. I think that's not quite boundless. Yeah. It's sort of like, you know. Yeah, on its way. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Beautifully described. I mean, I, 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 one piece of suggestion that I'll put on the side, but I think what you're describing is, is so, um, like illustrative in a way, because it's very easy to get this idea that awareness is here. Uh -huh. And I'm always startled when I realize like, oh yeah, awareness is like my whole body, right? Like my whole body is where awareness is and then beyond, right? Like you were saying, like it starts to get dissolved, uh -huh. but it's, it's so conditioned for um, many of us that you know, my awareness is here. It's like up and out and here. And then to really find a presence of it, which is, um, you know, diffuse is an interesting word. Um, there can be quite a lot of resolution in it. And so it's possible that like parts of the full resolution or kind of the full, I hate to use these um, kind of material metaphors, but you know, the pixels in a photo, right? The high resolution. And so maybe it's in soft focus right now, Okay. but more resolution might start kind of filtering in as you described. And I think, you know, it really is um, for, for many of us hard to live in the body, even if it's only because we're so distracted and busy, we're living, well, oh gosh, I can't remember that great quote. Um, it's a, it's a writer about like the man who lived like a foot or two above his body. Um, I think it's James Baldwin. Like he lived five feet above his body, right? As many of us do, like we're in a fantasy world about who we are, what we're doing. And when that happens, we're actually, we're not here and not inhabiting. And so we get this idea of, okay, I need to be in the body, the body, the body, like you feel the body, somatic, this somatic, that. But then strangely, we come to the body and it's empty. <laughs> so it's like really, it's just like a really interesting exploration, you know, that we kind of, yeah, we got to like get ourselves in there. And so I was trying to guide us like form body, subtle body or feeling body, dharmakaya, like the more emptiness. Um, and we'll work with some bogakaya and nirmanakaya in the coming weeks. <laughs> just these layers of how awareness starts to illuminate these different aspects of being conscious in a body, I'd say. Okay. Thank you. Very yeah, much. yeah. Thank you for sharing. Beautiful. Yeah. And I know, you know, um, just in reflecting on, on your time and practice here that, you know, these practices of spaciousness and spacious awareness are becoming easier right? And uh, I love my teacher, Jennifer Wellwood, says there's the, the waking up, right, which is the transcendence and the kind of ability to have the spacious awareness, and then the waking down. We can't just do this. We actually have to come back into the body, integrate into the body, and not just because that's a, a good balance, but in some ways, when we go up and out, we kind of lose a little bit of, you know, being here earthbound on this planet in relationship with others. 
So what she calls the waking down isn't just like feeling the body. It's like, yeah. And then how do you show up at coffee with your beloved? <laughs> right? Not up here. <laughs> it's like right here. And if only enough, you know, plant milk for one cup of coffee, then where's your awareness and awakeness? And right. So it's like, how do we do both? So thank you so much, Tom. Yeah. Oh, great. We got a little yellow hand. Can't see your name though. I'm so sorry. Louise. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm so drawn to this idea of the elements or I can't remember what language you used, um, that the author of the book with the um, of drawing on nature. And I just had this moment like um, during the practice where I think he said something like, I, I, I'm probably getting the words wrong, but there was, there was something about um, the familiar or the um, coming back to the body and oh, returning to the body and um, having that um, sacredness that's always there or something like that. And it was just so comforting. And I think it was sort of coincided with all the rain. <laughs> I was thinking about the water element and, um, yeah, it's mm. just very cool. So. So thank you. Nothing more to really say. Just, yeah, Louise, yeah. yeah. And it's so interesting. Again, you know, I, I hesitate. Like so much of my life I've spent translating or not so much. It's, I'm not, you know, uh, in my 70s, like many great, wonderful teachers. But so much of my life as a teacher uh, in this lifetime has been translating and trying to make it the most simple possible. And so I, I have avoided things like Dharmakaya and these words or but they are so provocative. And even if it's provocative, even bringing up the elements might be provocative of like, wow, the elements in my body, right? Or Dharmakaya. And it's, you know, I, I really hold these concepts or these ideas or these invitations just as that. And so if the invitation to the natural world brought forth, you know, that sense of being kind of, um, feeling that presence in the body. It's wonderful. And interestingly, I was reading a bit earlier today from Chogyam Trumpa on how he writes about the kayas or the three bodies, the Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Ramanakaya. And I'm going to teach them one by one. But he's like, yeah, they all kind of show up at the same time. And like, you can try to like, oh, we're going to go earth element and then water. And it's like, eh, it's probably all going to come together. And maybe I don't even lead it. And it's like there because it was brought into, you know, like, yeah. And the, the rain tonight just feels like so special uh, to be practicing. And it. it really gives us that support to feel kind of held in. So thank you. Diane. Oh, yeah. And then <laughs> oh, just quick. Victoria wanted to mention that. The reference you mentioned is from James Joyce um, from the Dubliners. Mr. Thank Duffy you. lived a short distance from his body. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Um, it's, it's time I meditate, like focusing on the body, like on a physical body, like this one was. I cannot, I always shifting to this perspective of, of focusing on the appearances of the physical body yeah and, and even more precise like focusing on the appearances of the sensations of the body oh interesting so if you can talk more about this like yeah this perspective of, and can you yeah. tell me like how do you see the sensations more like the appearance of sensations like sensations just appear so like if you're sitting there and there's like uh tingling um, I mean, just by sitting there, there are sensations like you know, touching the fur. Yes. Yeah. So focusing on the appearance of sensations. So like, as in seeing the foot on the floor, or, or like touching the fur. Touching the floor. Or just like a general sense. Like if you if you still like this, you have sensations of the body. Right? Yes. Is, right. So the you can talk a bit more about the appearance. Oh, they're more curious. No, no, I, yes, I totally get it. I thought you meant vis like visualizing, seeing appearance, yes. Because that is really funny, but like it's a very common thing for people, especially if they learn body scan practice, 
to imagine like literally their body, almost like it was in a copier, you know, like, oh, I'm scanning it from the, I see it from the outside. Um, so the appearance of sensations, yeah. And so the question is then like, how do we work with that? Or what is the... If you can know more about this perspective, not seeing the physical body, but seeing the appearance of the body. Yeah, interesting. You know, because there's, again, like with the physical body or the form body, I feel like that's the kind of most gross or um, broad level, not gross as in yuck, but gross as in different than subtle, like gross and subtle. And the form body, it's like our way in. So it's like, okay, my feet are on the floor, I can feel myself on the chair. I can kind of maybe even notice and feel the sensation of the fabric of my clothes or the waist of my jeans. And that's um, like very concrete. And then I think next kind of sensations appear or arise. And we recognize that there is, you know, the prana or the, um, the uh, tigle and the nadis and like all the energy depending on what system you're drawing from, all the energies in the body, which is kind of like sensation. You know, again, sensations can be more kind of gross, like, oh, I have an itch or my shoulder hurts. But that subtler level of the body in which there's the energy moving through, the appearance of that is often a little bit less discreet, meaning the itch comes and goes, and the ache is kind of like there and not there but the experience of the kind of cascading sense of energy in the body. Is that more what you're describing? Maybe that's cause that's, that's what I start to notice. You know, it's like you kind of have a sense of, um, yeah, the sense like, and I can feel it right now, like the sensations throughout the whole body that are just happening, not coming and going. And that's this like true, like aliveness of the body. And then strangely, with that aliveness, the body feels less like a whole or less confined. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, again, there's no um, contemporary scientific definition as to why that might happen. But when you look at the traditions, they really do, like they will show like visual, like, oh yeah, you're in your form body. And then you're in your subtle body and it's like slightly bigger. And then you're in awareness body. And it's like this huge Michelin man body <laughs> that like extends everywhere. And so it's just, yeah, I don't, it's, it's hard because I want there to be a scientific explanation. And yet I feel very comforted by like, you know, thousands of years of observation that this close attention to the body and especially like the subtle sensations of the body. And so like the kind of, appearance of as you're describing or it's almost like the revealing of the sensations always that are there in the body and maybe some of you have seen like an alex gray poster we should bring one in here you know and he has like all the channels all the noddies and you just see and you're like I, yeah like i know that you know that like you kind of feel that sense of the coursing energy of the body does it does it help your practice yeah beautiful thank you so much of course, Brett and then Cage. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about that, the that sensation of the subtle body. Um, because you're saying it's like kind of always there, and it's not something that arises and goes away, right? I, I understand that concept, but for me, the sensation of it, I I feel it sort of move. Yeah. So it is yes. moving. Yes. Yes. Always there, moving. Totally. It, it doesn't sit still. Yes but it's like flowing and moving. Yes, undulating. Undulating. Possibly, yeah. it depends, it's like, and I think, yeah, if it was an Alex Gray, um, you know, it'd be great if it was like a, a video or something yeah. instead of a still image, because you could see the coursing through. And for me, I could feel that when I've felt that, built into that, I can feel that. And then sometimes it flows up here and it almost, there's almost visual sensations that mm. arise and then, Low. Yeah. So that was happening. Sometimes that visual sensation helps bring me into the feeling it in my mm. body. Interesting. Like actual colors or just it's just kind of like a like a, a brightness yeah. that happens yeah. here. 
and then it can kind of filter down and fe I can feel sort of that brightness, but it's not a, a visual thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. A, a lot of, you know, things arise and if, especially if you meditate with your eyes open, there can be a phase in which everything kind of blurs and glows and then yeah. settles and it's, um, you know, my learning of the subtle body mostly is from Sokni Rinpoche and, uh, and some work with acupuncture and it's, it's just pretty incredible. And in the tradition of the subtle body, especially from Tibetan Buddhism, there is an idea that there are often these like energy blockages. So kind of Tom, back to your point where we kind of get blocked in certain areas. Um, and this can be a difficult emotion or, you know, fear and, as we start to really bring more attention awareness into the subtle body, we can kind of unblock. And sometimes when we unblock, there's actually quite a large energetic feeling. Sometimes it's really pleasant. Sometimes it's not very pleasant. Uh, sometimes there's a visual with it. Um, it's really interesting. And this one, luckily for me, for my scientific needs, there's like pretty good evidence of, you know, how at least stress and difficult emotions get stored in the body and that we recognize there is a, a way that we can kind of hold difficult emotions in the body and they can indeed be released. So that kind of makes sense in terms of how to unblock the flow. And according to Wangel Rinpoche, right? Like probably all those little blockages are like our pain body, you know? Cause he's not talking about pain body as subtle body, but there's a real overlay, a real similarity in like how we just get blocked and like all those little, cause in the Tibetan system, there's like all these little nodes and nodule. It looks like a whole freeway system. And there's like crossing and coming back and, you can imagine if any of them get blocked, a whole other area gets, you know, cut off. And for me, this is interesting because I, sometimes I've had body work done. And so that's sort of this gross sensation yeah. and the, the yes. subtle body can start yes. moving. Yes. And then the emotions can come and there could be release. Yeah. That, that kind of how they relate in some way. And they can go both ways, mm -hmm. right? Our big emotion may shift the subtle body and actually land in the body mm -hmm. too. So, yeah. Thank you. As an unlicensed professional here, just speaking. <laughs> but, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. oh. Stuck. Um, cool. Yeah, that was great. Um, yeah, I've been really kind of, out, you know, hovering, hovering above my body for the week. So, and today it felt like I was kind of coming back and um, definitely noticed being back during the meditation. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate, mm -hmm. um, appreciated the opportunity to experience that. Um, yeah, I, I guess like a couple things that I noticed and, and then, a, then a question. Um, so, you know, I've, I've always been a really fidgety person. And so just kind of like getting into well, I'm just sitting right now and not like kicking my legs around or stretching or waving my arms or like, you know, hitting something or whatever is like sort of like stillness in itself. Right. Yeah. But then like, you know, in kind of, you know, trying to be more still, it's like, I, I start noticing all the things that I'm doing that still aren't really, you know, like the needing to like, you know, like slightly adjust my posture and, um, and, and then, and then noticing like when I pull my shoulders back, I do get like a wash of that sort mm -hmm. of that, that energy. And I'm just like wondering, okay, so maybe it's two questions. Um, I'm wondering like with these sort of stillness practices, like at what point, <laughs> you know, how, how frozen should I be? Um, <laughs> because like there, there, you know, like, um, and then, um, I also noticed like, you know, I, to not move, right. To be still like, I squeeze my hands or like, I'll like, mm -hmm. like clench my muscles mm -hmm. to like not move or to like resist an itch or something like that. And is that blocking, um, that energy flow? Is that like a pain body thing? Is that, I don't know yeah. uh, what, there's two questions in there, I think. No, um, great question. So, I'm glad to hear you're re-inhabiting the body. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah, and you know, there is, it's really tough to be again, like in our everyday household or life where we aren't, you know, cultivating a lot of stillness, 
there's not a lot of opportunities in the day to cultivate stillness. And then we're just like, oh, and now I'm going to be still. I think it's really hard. You know, it's kind of like, like just putting on the parking brake or something as you're driving down the street. And what can really help, and this is, you know, a bit of a, a challenge, but in like extra homework, but it is, can you find stillness in like little moments throughout the day where it doesn't feel so um, burdensome? You know, so a very simple one that's often recommended by teachers is right before you go to bed, can you really connect with stillness? So right, maybe you're reading or hopefully not doom scrolling or whatever it is you're doing before bed. And before you like close your eyes and go to sleep, just connect with stillness in the body and the mind. Right when you wake up, connect with stillness before your coffee or, you know, just so to kind of, and then if you have a moment in the day between things, just kind of like for a moment, like open up completely to stillness, just to start developing that sense and that felt experience in the body. We definitely don't want to like effort our way to stillness. And yet we do have to have some discipline with it because if we're just like, oh, I'm just going to itch if I have an itch, or I'm going to move, I want to move, you know, the invitation or instruction is often notice the impulse and then mindfully move. So instead of, I really want to move my back, and but you, you, there's no even thinking of it. You're just like moving your back. Like actually notice I have an impulse to like move my shoulders and release my back. What is it like to want that? And then really be conscious like, okay, now I'm feeling it. Oh, now I get that release and then return. And so you're not preventing or like blocking or forcing yourself to not have that movement. You're bringing conscious awareness. So you're still saturating it with awareness. So that would be invitation. Yeah, you don't wanna block or um, kind of create tension, you, but you also, the discipline matters. You can't just be too kind of easy with it. Oh. So then it's the discipline and stillness. I mean, I don't know, I like, because like there is still, you know, a movement, right, that's happening. And I guess in the, the subtle body that I'm not using the way. Sorry. I will all repeat it. Yeah. Um, I, I think I know what your question is, like the discipline in being still or, I mean, I think the discipline is in like creating that pause, the pause, creating the pause, mm -hmm. is like the intention to be still, I guess. Not, but not actually. Well, you know, and a lot of stillness, again, a lot of the stillness is, is like some of it is finding what's naturally there. And then part of it is like kind of cleaning out what's in the way. And in that cleaning out, which is the desire to just kind of move and, and be rest. And like, you know, oh my gosh, I think all of us are entrained to fidget, right? Like that's kind of nervous energy many of us hold, maybe not everyone. And so to really bring awareness to the desire to fidget. And so if you still do it, there's at least awareness with it. And so instead of training kind of a default, non-aware process of being, you're training and bringing awareness and that's the discipline. Yeah, good question. Okay, yeah, we've got a couple of questions. This is great, I love some questions. These are wonderful questions. Thank you. Hey, so I'm mostly trained in traditions that explore the, the idea that we're not the body and it's the main illusion. <laughs> but then I, uh, for the past few years, I've been studying with indigenous people who mm. kind of brought me down back into Mother Earth and my, my own body. Yeah. Uh, I forget what you called it, like the downward awakening. Yes, or, mm -hmm. uh -huh. waking down, yeah. But uh, today during meditation, I had the realization of why it's so uncomfortable to be in the body. Mm -hmm. So, um, a few a few weeks ago, I was in the Amazon rainforest, and I I got bit by a spider. Mm. And when I came back, I've been um, really thinking a lot about it, about mm. how venomous it is, mm. and is spending a lot of energy on my body. Mm. And today, during meditation, as you were speaking, it kind of clicked that this idea of like body is very vulnerable. Mm. It feels, you know, the body is you know, weak, there's a lot of misconceptions and mm. preconceptions mm. and that it's much easier for me, I guess, still this idea of like lofty spirituality out there yeah. versus here. Yeah. 
Beautiful. Yeah. And in what, in that kind of realization of vulnerability, what did, yeah, what, what arose or what was your experience? I mean, it was really powerful in the sense of seeing that there's still something to sit with, mm -hmm. you know, that I, I really felt that, you know, studying with the indigenous that I finally came back, like all of a sudden, wow, I actually have a body for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. But I think now it's like this awareness of misconceptions that have to be cleared out. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea the body is weak. Yeah. You know, right. and that it's dangerous to be in the world. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it was a beautiful gift. So oh, thank you for that. I'm so glad. And thank you for sharing. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. And I really, um, I don't want to put down any approaches or traditions, you know, and I think it's beautiful to have transcendence and there is refuge in transcendence, right? Like in those spacious places. And yeah, we do live in the body, <laughs> undeniable. And, and I, and that's, and I do love like, you know, especially the Vajrayana and Dzogchen approach where you have the spaciousness and the embodiment also together, it's very helpful. And it is interesting to start, like, as you're describing, like that kind of those insights that might arise as we're settling into the body. It's almost like, yeah, I don't know how to describe it as though the body is finding its way to communicate itself to us. Yeah. And that's, you know, you see these yogis who sit, of course, for uh, months or years in a cave. And one of their main practices is on impermanence. You know, and kind of how the body, this body will be a corpse and, you know, everyone we know will be a corpse and not to be negative, but to really embrace the precious, tender vulnerability of human life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. In the back. You just bring it back there, pass it around. Thank you. Right. Maybe. Maybe oh yeah, there's there's plenty. <laughs> we go armed. Oh yeah. So my point might not be insightful, it might just be dumb, but for most of my meditation career, when people said focus on stillness, yeah. I was overcomplicating it and thinking it was like a mental stillness. Yeah. In the way that like a pool of water is still. Yeah. Like the opposite of turbulent. Yep not in the way that like a parked car is still. Mm. And I only in the past few weeks have realized that like what most people are talking about, at least at its most basic level, is like the way that a stationary object is still. Mm. Like <laughs> I'm literally still. Yeah. And it became so much easier. Well, once but, I acknowledge that. But I have a question. Well, it's absolutely not dumb, but I, a question for you about that. When you're a parked car, yep. does the mind feel still? I don't know how to answer that. Really, yeah, but. just so then an exploration, because I think <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's both and, you know, there are many metaphors where we use exactly as you described beautifully, like the stillness of the water and then like the turbulence or even like the turbidness, meaning like the mud kicked up in it, all these different ways the mind can get really agitated. And, you know, there is... Um, such a connection between stillness of the body. It's like the stillness of the body shows the mind how to be still. And so I think this idea of like kind of trying to park the mind first is like really hard, but if you can park the body, it like helps the mind and we can find, you know, there's this beautiful line. I don't know if it's a Sangha or a Tisha, or, but this idea of like the stillness within the movement and that you can really find in the mind. You can find the stillness of spacious awareness, like we were in spacious awareness, uh, even with the movement, everything moving. And so, um, yeah, let me know if like, when we practice stillness, maybe you notice or like peak, like is the mind still too? Right, I will. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, hi, so today's my first day here. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for this beautiful practice. 
Um, so I, when I do meditation, I usually do like very simple technique, focusing on my breath, just in and out, in and out. Um, but today I really try to focus on my body, um, and like this concept of emptiness, mm. but I felt two very different, um, feelings at the same time. So one, on the one hand, I felt very like light and free, mm. um, and spacious, which was beautiful, but also at moments, um, I felt very scared because mm -hmm thinking that like there's this huge like vastness like emptiness in my body yeah. it almost felt like I'm kind of like losing myself yeah. and I'm thinking oh like there's supposed to be like water blood yeah. or, like gas in my body but there's like nothing left and like who am I you know so I was like also kind of like freaking out um and I like, don't know what to make out of it so yeah, yeah just beautiful sure wow your first night and you have fear of annihilation that's <laughs> <laughs> awesome <laughs> truly awesome yeah, and I think I will say that, you know, if your main practice is is focusing on the breath, it's such great stability for these practices. So we're, we never graduate from shamatha, from focused attention, right? If we're really stabilizing. I like that you said the simple, and you didn't say easy practice of focusing on the breath, because focusing on the breath is so hard. I think it's really one of the hardest practices. And so if we have some kind of establishment there, then the expansion actually comes much more naturally and can, and can be more stable. If you don't have that focused attention, you can maybe open for a little and then you get distracted. So anyway, so I think that makes sense that that your main practice, it was possible to open. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really common to have that fear of annihilation or fear of, you know, wow, like if the body is really this spacious, like, who am I? You know, what am I? What is this? And um, just as kind of Tom was describing, it's really nice to titrate into that. So to feel it and be like, wow, there's something here that is this possibly, uh, my word's not yours, but intrinsic sense of like nourishment to feel that spaciousness. And then there might be like, oh God, I don't like it. And just kind of come back to the breath, no problem. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's really great because our meditation practice, of course, is helping us develop stable attention, to feel relaxed, to feel calm, but it's also to give us insight into impermanence, everything changing, that we are both a body and not a body, right? <laughs> you know, that both of those things can be true, or that more that we are a body and consciousness is within the body and not limited to the body. That's the kind of feeling. So yeah thank you so much thanks for sharing yeah just a just a quick one as people have been talking about stillness i i can't stop thinking about stillness in the, the frame of reference of stillness and just the stillness we're always in motion but there's the stillness of throwing a ball in the air and then it's still for just a second at the apex and that's what it the few moments where I feel like I can access stillness, that's what it feels like. Mm. Like there's stuff happening and then there's an apex and I'm back in it. Right. And then the spaciousness has been such a gift. Mm. Like it's been such a transformative pill. Mm. And I had an experience in the meditation today where I have learned in this last year that I, in meditation, often end up very much in my storytelling mind, my metaphorical mind. Mm. I'm, I'm imagining myself meditating. Um, and it's quite powerful. It's helpful. Like I, the, mm. the image of like, I've got the thought and the thought is dissolving. The, the spaciousness has been so powerful because instead of fighting the thought, I can be like, no, the thought isn't something vast. And yeah. The thought is smaller. Um, but when you um, shared the thought about being in the body, um, it was a really... It was a glimpse of something for me that I found quite difficult, which was, uh, and so it was just a, a moment of it, but the moment of uh, feeling for a second that the body is just kind of doing that naturally mm -hmm. instead of having to, you know, think my way into dissolving the thought and all that, just coming up with the images and like doing the storytelling that in practice, the thought was very small in relation to the size of the body, or as I experienced it, the thought was still massive. Then the body was, you know, even bigger in that mm. frame of reference. Um, is that something I, 
I was about to say, I'm going to try to meditate on, but I was like, nope, I'm going to try and not try yeah. a little bit more. Yeah. Anyway, just a glimpse. Beautiful. Just a glimpse. Yeah, yeah. And I love what you're pointing out of, you know, this kind of dance with knowing, feeling, experiencing. It can be really hard to not grasp onto and reify an idea of what we should do. So that's part of the reason I don't like bringing up these terms like Dharmakaya or luminous awareness. And you're like, okay, where's Dharmakaya? I'm like, where's luminous awareness? Do I feel it? And instead, like you're describing, and actually Tom described too, of kind of letting, you know, awareness aware you, right? If you could say, let the body breathe you, let awareness manifest as awareness through you without kind of forcing into it and that's yeah and it might only be a moment and you know um check it out it might be a moment of bliss sometimes when that awareness arises naturally also it's really nice and the moment you notice it's nice you're like god <laughs> but yeah yeah sweet thank you yes please cool uh this is my first time here too Thanks to Sylvie, who guides me to all the right things. <laughs> so uh, this will feel like a confession. So I used to meditate only uh, in the closet. Uh, so that's a different story. <laughs> but so I like total sensory deprivation. Yeah. Right. Like I had the best, you know, headphones and best eye mask. And it was, and then I would just like vanish. Like I love cool. the annihilation. Like yeah. I'm out. <laughs> and then I did you know, a bunch of like open eyes and stuff and like a bunch of other techniques. And I find that like you like the rain, but I'm like, it just keeps taking me away. Mm -hmm. But I feel like being in the dark with sensory deprivation is like some weird form of cheating but I'm like angry at my senses. Like I wish that like hmm. smell and sight and hearing wasn't up north so that it would be a little more balanced, you know? Hmm. So I'm interested in your reflections yeah. on like, yeah, the senses leading you up high mm -hmm. and the deprivation of them versus just open eyed awareness all the time. Yeah. And I do, I, I mean, I do think sensory deprivation, you know, one government Bache runs a dark retreat center and so, um, you know, there's definitely a tradition of like 49 days of dark retreat and, and how that helps really calibrate our understanding of mind uh, and consciousness that we really see everything come out of nothing. And we, we live in the world. And so it may or may not help us kind of in that transfer of like, what am I experiencing in meditation and how can I bring that to my everyday life? So I think cultivating both is really important. Um, since so much of what creates suffering is how we respond to something in our sensory environment. I don't like that smell. I don't like that sound. I don't like that look on your face, right? Whatever, you know, <laughs> like we get, it's like, and, and just working with, you know, that, that meeting of, you know, whatever our sense consciousness is with the stimulus in our world. So I think it's great to work with both and to recognize like, wow, I really have a preference and that's okay. Like I really enjoy. And I guess with the dark, you know, the full dark, the only question I would have is, is it like, cause we can have spaciousness, but without the brightness of awareness. And that is not practicing meditation. That's practicing dullness mm -hmm. and it feels good but like it's not actually practicing to transform the mind and so is there if there's brightness no there is yeah it's just more downward it's like even spread and then yeah. like the lines are less clear yeah Lots. yeah yeah and you know i have a friend who uses the the blind the mind fold yeah. i don't know if you're yeah like it's like a eye mask for <laughs> practicing so that you can like have your eyes open but in the dark and you know i think it it's great but again it's nice so glad you're here to just kind of practice other types and approaches and then yeah that closet situation sounds pretty good <laughs> um so wonderful everybody's questions like real so much richness uh what i the other thing i wanted to bring up tonight tonight which i'll bring up just briefly is there's an invitation from Wangel Rinpoche before we start getting into applying these different elements into our life, the earth and the air and the fire and um, the water. And he says that 
in order for us to really be able to identify and work well with those essences and those elements in the world, we have to do some pretty uh, honest reflections and on questions on our about our life. And like, where do we need to retrieve from? And what do we need to retrieve? So his invitation um, is for us to really consider uh, what do we need like in our personal life, like what essences do we need? What is our experience? And the way he describes personal is, what is it like for you when you're alone without your phone? He didn't say that exactly, but you know, when you're like alone and what is the quality of that? You know, sometimes maybe it changes. Maybe sometimes it's really pleasant and enjoyable. Sometimes it's really agitating. Sometimes it's really lonely, but to really be curious and reflect on what might be missing from, you know, this sense of how we are when we are alone. Like we might need that groundedness of earth. We might need that fluidity of water. And so to get really curious and reflect, like when I'm alone and it's hard, what is hard? Most people have kind of like an immediate hit or like, no, I'm not sure. I don't feel that. <laughs> And you don't have like a, a hit of like what it's like that's hard when you're on your own alone just with yourself. Oh, it's limitless. Endless buffet. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The elements like in order for us to choose the right element, we actually have to know like what's hard in us. Like what are we needing that isn't there? Yeah. I mean, if you're alone, it's another person. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there can also be just, you know, worry, right? Like the presence of like, you know, what is it that other person, what are we needing that person for? Like, what's the thing we're feeling that we don't want to feel before we reach for the phone or the whatever, you know, like, what are we trying to not feel or be with is a question. Mm some big nods. Okay. And then he asks us to do the same with like, he calls it family, but I think he also includes examples of friends and, you know, loved ones as well, or the people you're in relation, in intimate relationship with, or peoples you're in intimate relationship with. And so, you know, where do we get depleted there? Where do we feel run down? And he gives some examples of someone, you know, it's not just presence or absence of family. Many of us have had an experience where we have a family member who is really sick mentally or physically, and it's a source of great drain or difficulty. Like, what's the quality of depletion that we get? What are we needing? What are we lacking? He asks us the same with work. Like, where, where is it that we feel the lack? You know, what are we... Where does our dissatisfaction stem from? Could be more than one thing, but really recognizing the quality of it. Because we can't, you know, it's like you can't go to you know, a pharmacy and just be like, give me one of everything. <laughs> like, I don't know what's wrong, right? You have to actually know, like, oh, my head hurts or I have a rash or, right? Can my eyes are itchy. Yeah. Does he define like what kind of medicine each element is? Yes. Three weeks away, we're going to get there. Before we before we do, he said, this is all the pre-work. Like, we're not even allowed into that apothecary yet. Yeah. Like, he really wants us to be reflecting, like, look deeply at your life, you know, is, is part of his invitation. And we can do that more next week, too. And then to work. And then the other is is nature. You know, what do we feel when we're in nature? Is there something we need that we're not, like, do we feel uncomfortable? Or are we scared? Like, What's our relationship with the natural world? So I think that's what we will follow up with. And next week, we'll do our deep dive onto the refuge of infinite awareness, a.k.a. silence. So that will be nice. But let's take a moment here together to dedicate the merit. Reconnecting with the body and the breath. Mm. 
and taking a moment to notice if there's any sense of maybe more presence, any sense of connection or inspiration that may have come from our time here together. And if it's comfortable placing the hands together in front of the chest, and the symbolic gesture of offering, and we consider offering up any of that sense of inspiration or connection, refreshment, we offer that up completely to make our practice its fullest. We dedicate it for the sake of all beings, that all beings could know peace and ease, that all beings could be healthy and strong, that all beings could feel belonging and love, that all beings everywhere of all kinds could be free. So wonderful to be with you all tonight. Thank you. And um, yeah, for the new people, I'm Eve. I forgot to mention that. And this weekend, we're going to do a half day. We're going to sit and we're going to do the preliminaries and really just meditate together 12 to 4 um, here and just really spend as much time as we can kind of cultivating that sense of stillness and silence giving our, ourselves some space to let our mind stretch out and do so. And then two hours later at 6.30, Chandra, Lopan Chandra Easton, who some of you know, amazing teacher, Tibetan scholar, um, is, it's at seven? Six. Oh, it's at six, not at 6.30, at six. She's coming for her uh, release of her book, The 21 Taras, so beautiful, um, kind of, I don't even know how to describe it, but she has done such an amazing job of making these beautiful Tara representations into teachers in our everyday life. So if you want to come for a full day of your Dharma Collective Joy, please do. Um, I'm teaching a three-day retreat at Big Bear the weekend of April 12th, and I'm teaching a two-day retreat at Esalen the week of May 10th. Big Bear is going to be more reflective, quiet, Esalen, more group process, and um, both really focusing on emotion and emotion awareness. 